So today, this morning, we're going to do kind of what we did yesterday. Remember how I had the first two sessions yesterday, so we kind of made a long session and then had a break and then did a little mini session? That's what we're going to do again this morning. So if you're like watching the clock, okay, it's not going to look like it normally does, but that's okay. It's a good thing. So this morning, we're going to talk about God. Good topic? Yes? Yeah, we're about that? Okay, good, good. And go ahead. Oh, I need to get everybody back. There's one more. Um, you will need your black pen and a clean piece of paper. We're going to play a game. I'm going to wait for her, though. There are only two rules to my game. Pretty simple, right? All right. Two rules. That's it. You can use whichever color you want, but, but just use black. Just use black. Black's best. Black or blue? Black or blue, not red. All right. Two rules to my game. The first rule is you may only draw what I tell you. Nothing more, nothing less. You may only draw what I tell you. The second rule is on the count of three, everyone in here must close their eyes. And you may not open your eyes until I tell you you can open them. Now. Let me tell you, you're a Bible school. God's watching. All right? One, two, three. Everybody, close your eyes. You've got your pen in your hand, and you've got your paper in front of you. With your eyes closed, draw for me the frame of a house. So just a square. Just draw a square. All right, you've got the frame of your house. Your eyes are still closed. Now draw a roof on your house. Keep your eyes closed. The eyes are closed. And you draw a roof, just a triangle is fine, a roof on your house. Now, you're, you're going to maybe, it's a beautiful day because it's on Kauai. This is where your house is. So go ahead and draw a big sun up in the sky. Oh, it's a beautiful sun up in the sky. Keep your eyes closed. Eyes are closed. And you're standing in the house and you're looking at the sun through the windows. So you're going to need two windows on your house. <laughs> Keep your eyes closed. Two windows on the house. Okay, now we're, we're talking about the sky and the sun. So how about draw a couple of clouds, a couple of beautiful clouds up in the sky. Yes, that would be lovely. Maybe a couple of little birds. You know, you can just draw a couple of lines if you want. That's fine. I don't know. Draw a couple of little birds up in the sky. Oh, your, your house. Your house has a door. You're going to need a door on your house because every house has to have a door. So go ahead and draw a door on your house. Good, good. Now, a lot of houses often have like a picket fence in front of them. So how about draw a beautiful picket fence, keep your eyes closed, right there in front of your house. Perfect, perfect. Now, um, we don't really have chimneys here on Kauai, but what we do have are satellite dishes. So draw a satellite dish on top of the house. Satellite dish, keep your eyes closed. I don't even know what they look satellite dish. I mean, it can just be a round thing with a stick. That's fine. And last but not least, I know that you are all good Christians who love to do your devotions, so draw yourself sitting in a chair with your Bible doing your devotions in the house. So, yeah, sure, sure. Yes, you're doing you're <laughs> yourself sitting in a chair with your Bible, reading your Bible because you just love to do your devotions. Yep, that's you sitting in a chair in your house, loving that. All right, and last but not least, I need you to write at the bottom of your page the word darkness. Darkness, D-A-R-K-N-E-S-S. -S. Once you have written the word darkness, you may open your eyes and look at your masterpiece. Wait, <laughs> on the roof, I see. <laughs> okay, show me your houses. Show me your houses. Let me see this. Let me 
Let me see your houses. Let me see this. Oh, oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> All right. Whoa, 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 wait, 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 wait. Guys, um, <clears throat> no offense, but um, these are awful. <laughs> um, I, I, look, look at me, look at me, look at me. I don't, I don't understand. I, I don't get it. Okay. I gave you every resource you needed. I gave you a pen, yeah? I gave you a pen. I gave you paper yesterday, yeah? I gave you those journals, yeah? Okay, I gave you instructions on how to do it. I even spoke in English. I, like, I've got other languages, right? But I spoke your language, so I... Wow. <laughs> so what, what's the problem? Took away our eyesight. Darkness. God has given us every resource we need. And here in the United States, we are so blessed. We have Bibles, we have churches, we have podcasts, we have Christian radio, we have preachers on TV, we have preachers on the internet. We're able to meet in fellowship and we have Bible school. But if you don't truly know who God is, this is how your lives and your ministry are going to look. You have all the pieces there, but if you don't actually truly know who he is, this is what you'll reproduce. Because you can only reproduce what you are. And so if you have a wrong concept of who God is, guess what's going to trickle down and what's going to happen as you go out and become pastors and youth pastors and children's ministers and music leaders and missionaries? This. And that's what we're going to try to prevent today. What if the God that you think that you know isn't the God who is? What if the God who you think that you know isn't the God who is? Give me some concepts that you know of what people have told you or said to you about God. What do people say? People say some negative things, yeah? You ever heard it? What do people say? Who they think he is. Oh, God wants me to be happy. That would be a positive thing. That's good. I like that. Okay. What else? What do people say? Fickle. Fickle. The God's fickle. Yeah. What else? Judgmental. Ooh, judgmental. Yep. What else? What do people say? If God was there, why would you let this happen? Yep. I've heard it. Preached on it yesterday. Yep. <laughs> right? Why does God let bad things happen to good people? Yep. Okay. How about this one? Have you ever heard anybody say that God is mean? Oh, yeah. I mean, he's a mean God. I mean, have you ever read the Old Testament? <laughs> Yikes. Okay, how about vengeful? Have you ever heard anybody say that God is vengeful? That if you do something bad, then, then, or you sin, then God will do something bad to you or make something bad happen to you? I've had people tell me before that they did something bad and then they got cancer because God made that happen to them. Or they got in a car wreck. Let me ask you, I know you guys aren't parents yet and I'm not either, but just... Would you ever, no matter how bad your kid was, would you ever put cancer on them? Gosh, no. Would you ever make them get into a car wreck because they disobeyed you? Of course not. Okay, how about this? God is so strict. I mean, have you seen all the rules in that book? And all he wants you to do is check off all the boxes, right? All right, how about this? God, he's kind of scary. I mean, there's parts in the Old Testament where, where somebody, a group of people sins, and then he just smites them all. Thousands of people die. One where the ground just eats the whole family? Yikes. I mean, that could scare you. I could see that. Okay, how about... That God is just always upset. He's sitting up there in heaven, looking down here at us. He just can't do anything right. And he's just always upset. Okay, how about angry? He's an angry God. How about bossy? All he wants to do is just tell you how to run your life. Tell you what to do with your life. And because of all that, many people think that he's distant. 
I mean, let's be honest, I wouldn't want to be close to somebody that's like that anyway, right? So then they have this concept that he's this high and mighty guy in the sky way up there, and we're way down here. But what if the God that you think that you know isn't the God who is? Turn with me in your Bible to Luke. Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 41. Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 41. Every year his parents, Jesus' parents that is, went to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the feast according to the custom. After the feast was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Thinking he they traveled on for a day. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me, he asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Verse 49, why were you searching for me, he asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? This moment changed everything. Now let's recap here. Mary and Joseph have just lost the Son of God. This is bad. They're not getting Parent of the Year Award, okay? This is really bad. And so what they do is they're searching and searching and searching for him. They go back to where they originally were, and they're looking and looking, and where do they find him? He's in the temple. And Mary says to him, son, why have you done this to us? And Jesus says, didn't you know I needed to be in my father's house? And then it says, they didn't understand. This moment is pivotal in our Christian faith. This moment is pivotal in the history of Christianity, and here's why. And here's why they didn't understand, because throughout the entire Old Testament, there were hundreds of names of God used thousands of times, but never once was that name Father. What if the God that you think that you know isn't the God who is? So 18 years after the whole Jerusalem incident and Jesus being found in the temple, Jesus is with his 12 disciples. And he decides to continue this thought process. His disciples come up to him and they said, Jesus, teach us how to pray. That's a good, good question to ask Jesus, right? This is good. It's a good request. Jesus, teach us how to pray. And so Jesus teaches them a prayer that I'm pretty sure all of you know. We say it at funerals. We say it at weddings. We say it with our kids. We say it it pretty much everywhere when there's a gathering and somebody wants to say a prayer, even before a ball game, right, a lot of times. What is it? What's it called? The Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer. Do you know it? Yes. Yeah? Okay, let's say it together. Ready? Our Again, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Stop! 
What's his name? When Jesus taught his disciples to pray, the one name that he used for how we are to address God is Father. This changes everything. Let's go over now to Luke chapter 15. Jesus wants to continue with this lesson. Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15, starting in verse 11. Now, we have a little problem here. Because... As they were writing the Bible, they started adding these titles, okay? The titles were not in the original text. And I think they've really got it wrong on this one. Because in my Bible, maybe it says the same to you, it says the parable of the prodigal son. Is that what yours says? This is, no, what does yours say? The parable of the lost son. Okay, wrong. This is wrong. That is not what the story is about. The story is not about a son. Let me start it out here. Verse 11, Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. What's the story about? The man. The The story is about the man. Jesus is telling this story because he's trying to tell them about the man. The man. Jesus continues, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me your share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth on wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him out into his field to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare, and here I am starving to death? I will set out, I will go back to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servant, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Jesus is not telling this story to talk about how to return to your parent when you've gone the wrong direction in life. Jesus is telling this parable because he's trying to teach the people about the Father. So let's do a little recap. A son comes up to his Jewish father and says, basically, Dad, I wish you were dead. I mean, that's how you get an inheritance, right? Is if the father dies, then the son gets the inheritance. So he's saying, Dad, I was wish you were dead, but you're not. So because you're not, I want to go ahead and get my money. And surprisingly, the father empowers the son and actually gives him the money. The son goes out and he squanders it on wild living. Do I need to define that for you? Drugs, party, alcohol, sex, prostitutes, we got it, right? I mean, he's making it rain. Like he's going after it. And then, uh uh-oh, all the money's gone. And then he gets hungry. 
And he's got to do something. I mean, he has to have food, right? So he hires himself out to a local citizen to feed pigs. Now, how many of you are like, that's gross? It's pretty yucky, right? Okay, I don't think you guys understand the cultural times here. <laughs> this is beyond bad. Guys, this is a Jewish boy feeding pigs. Jews were not even allowed to look at a pig. And here this boy is, down on his hands and knees, wanting to eat the pods of the food that the pigs were eating. This is beyond low. But then, it says, the boy came to his senses. Now, this part isn't in scripture, but how many of you know there was the power of a praying mama behind that? <laughs> right? Some of you got those praying mamas. Okay, back to the story. Okay, so he comes to his senses, and he's like, my father's servants have more to eat than I do. I'll just go back. I'll say to my father, father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm not worthy to be your son, but please... Just allow me to be one of your servants. It's a good speech, right? Seems like a good speech. And so he journeys home. And as he's journeying home, he's repeating this speech in his mind. Father, I've sinned against heaven and earth. I'm no longer worthy to be your son. Please make me one of your servants. Father, I know that I've sinned against you in heaven and earth. And he's going through it. And scripture says that as he was returning home, his father saw him from a long way off, and what happened? He ran to him. He threw his arms around him. He started kissing his piggy face. My son, my son! He's embracing him. And then he calls out to his servants, Servants! Bring the best robe! The best robe would have belonged to who? The father. He was going to take his own robe to cover the sins of his piggy son. Then he says, bring the ring. Ring. See, back then, there was a ring that had a family symbol on it. The signet ring. And so he was giving that signet ring back to his son so that he could put it on to be a part of that family again. And if anybody tried to say to him, ha, you're not his son. Look what you did. You squandered all of his wealth. You offended your father. You're not part of the family anymore. He could say, I know, but look, daddy says I'm his. And then he says, bring the sandals. What, are they going to the beach? Like, that's weird, right? Actually, during that time in that culture, servants and slaves went barefoot in the house. Children wore shoes. And so by putting those sandals on his son's feet, he wanted his son to remember with every step that he took, I'm a son. I'm a son. I'm a son. So Jesus is telling this story because he wants them to know who the Father is. What if the God that you think that you know isn't the God who is? Now I'm going to be real honest with you. I lived the majority of my life up until a few years ago under this mindset of God. I was raised in a great Baptist church. I was at church every time the doors opened. My parents were Christians. And let me tell you, I read my five chapters a day. I prayed for two hours a day. I did everything I was supposed to. We even had these little cards at church that you would check off to say, how many people you invited to church? How many people you witnessed to? How many chapters you read that week? How many hours you prayed? You think I'm joking, but I'm serious. But see, you can only live under religion for so long before it burns you out. And before it just becomes something that you're doing. But see, with this story, all of a sudden, Jesus is showing the people that God is no longer about religion. He's about a relationship. 
and this changes everything. And I will also be honest and tell you that as a Baptist missionary for the first two years that I was on the field, I did missions under this because I'm type A enough. I'm organized enough to follow a formula and I'm authoritative enough. I have a personality that can get people to do things. And so I started and I planted a church under this. And then I burned out. Big time. Crash and burn. Because I was doing it all in my own efforts. And you can only reproduce what you are. So was I reproducing happy Christians who loved the Lord, who had a great relationship with him and who could hear his voice? No. Because I didn't know those things. I was living under an authoritarian who was telling me what to do, how to do, and I was following a formula. Was I saved? Yeah. Was I going to heaven? Yeah. Did I have abundant life? No. I didn't. Because I was living under this. And this is scary. This is no good. And so I started to dive into scripture and I started to ask people and I started to get into a little bit different church group and I realized, wait a second, he's not all about religion, he wants a relationship. And for me, this changed everything. I was no longer this uptight, authoritarian, Bible-beaten person. I had abundant life. Well, but then I realized I've got to do something with this. So do you know what we should do with this? Let me show you. We just take it over here. Yep. And you throw it out. You've got to get it out. Because as long as that is in the room, you will never be able to believe this. You've got to get it out. But the enemy wants you to believe that. He wants you to live under that because if he can't make you bad, he will bondage you to religion, to a spirit of religion. And it might look good and it might look pretty and it might look like something like you're a good Christian person and you've got it all together and you're planting churches and you're pastoring people, but you can only reproduce what you are. And I wasn't reproducing people who had abundant life until... I taught them how to hear the voice of God, and I taught them this. And once I taught them this, do you know what the first church plant said to me? Why didn't you tell us this earlier? This is awesome. And I said, because I didn't know. I didn't know. What if the God that you think that you know isn't the God who is? So I kept doing a deep dive into this topic. I want you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. First Corinthians chapter 13. Now many of you might know this chapter as the love chapter. I've officiated quite a few weddings and guess what they all want read at their wedding. The love chapter. Even unbelievers are like, will you read that Bible thing? And I'm like, 1 Corinthians 13? And they're like, yeah, that one. Because everybody knows this, right? They all know it. All right, 1 Corinthians 13, starting in verse 4. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Everybody go, oh, isn't that beautiful? Isn't that beautiful? It is beautiful, but wait a second. We need scripture to interpret scripture here. I always say that we need to have scripture interpret scripture. So now turn over with me to 1 John chapter 4. Let's look at something. 1 John chapter 4. First John 
Chapter 4 says, let's do verse 8. 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. love. All right. So if God is love, then I can go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and read, God is patient. God is kind. God does not envy. God does not boast. God is not proud. God is not rude. God is not self-seeking and God is not easily angered. God keeps no record of wrongs. God does not delight in evil, but God rejoices with the truth. God always protects. God always trusts. God always hopes. God always perseveres. God never fails. What if the God that you think that you know isn't the God who is? This changes everything. And you can have all the resources, you can have all the instructions, you can have all of the studies, the seminary, the Bible schools, the podcast, you can have it all, but if you don't know this part look back at your houses your life and your ministry are going to look like a hot mess because you've got to know who he is now if I was to give you the same instructions again but this time your eyes were open do you think your picture would look a little bit different mm -hmm. of course it would do you think that it might be a little prettier. Mm -hmm. Do you think that if you were going to give it away, somebody might appreciate it a little bit more? Mm -hmm. Of course. <laughs> Do you think somebody would really appreciate the first picture? No. And the reason that this changes everything is because not only does it let you know who God truly is and how he relates to you, but now you can relate to others in a pure form. Was what I was doing in the Amazon, planting churches under that mindset, bad? Was it sin? Was it wrong? Questionable. It wasn't truth. Was I doing a good thing? I mean, planting churches is pretty good, right? Telling people about Jesus is pretty good. But see, all the enemy has to do is get you one degree off from truth, and it's heresy. One degree off is sin. Satan's not going to come at you with horns and a pitchfork. He's going to come to you in an area that you're already in, and you are head on full strong going for God. Because he knows if he can get you to just go one degree off, then it's wrong. And he's taken you away from who God truly is. This changes everything. So we're going to do something a little different for the next few minutes. I'm going to invite our RAs to come up. And I'm going to turn on some music. And I'm going to give you an opportunity to get a hug from your Father God. We've prayed and we've just asked, Lord, make my arms your arms. I truly believe that as you come and receive, just like that prodigal son came toward his father, the Father will respond to you. What I think is so cool is that in Scripture, we never see the Father say any offensive word to the Son. 
didn't yell at his son. He didn't tell him how stupid he was. He didn't tell him how much he had sinned against him. He didn't get mad at him for squandering his wealth. What did the father do? The father embraced him. He kissed him. He brought him back into the family, and then he threw a party for him. If you'd like to just get out your journal, and you'd like to ask God a question, hear the voice of God as we do this, I invite you to do that. But I truly believe that as you come up and receive a hug, the spirit of religion will fall by the wayside. Addictions will fall by the wayside. Strongholds will fall by the wayside. They will be broken in the name of Jesus. Because the Father's embrace can change so much. Come up and just receive. Or you can journal or you can do both. happened to this side of the room? <laughs> what? I guess so. <laughs> well, I'm glad you all were okay with it. <laughs> I did bring the back. Righteousness. Very good. Good job. Yes. Good question. So, Father, we thank you so much for revealing to us what you did for the strongholds that were broken and for just your embrace. We just take a deep sigh of relief to know who you truly are. Thank you for your love. In your precious name we pray, Jesus. Amen. So I just feel we should take a little testimony time. Let's share before we get into the next part. What did God do? What did the Father reveal to you? Sure. You can read it. You can tell me about it. You can sing a song. You can do whatever you want. Go ahead. Well, that's a shame. Thank you. 
Line up with scripture? No. Line up with the character of what a good, loving father would say? Beautiful. Super. Thank you for sharing. Wow. That's powerful. I took that for myself, too. Thank you. Yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. Who's next? Please. Uh, God, how do I let go of my pain? Trent, you are my son, and there's nothing that will ever separate me from you. I love you too much to let you go. You must give your pain to me, because I have experienced your pain and sent my son to die for it. You are free in the name of Jesus. Come on. So good. With scripture? Is there more? No, I okay. Line up with the character of what a good, loving father would say. How would you respond to that? I wrote down some questions. To have to good. That. Okay. It's good. It's a good dialogue. Thank you for sharing. Who's next? Please. So good. Line up with scripture. Line up with the character of what a good loving father would say. Absolutely. Thanks for sharing. Okay. Who's next? Yes, please. Line up with scripture. Line up with the character of what a good loving father would say. Yeah, that's beautiful. Thank you for sharing. Who else? Isn't that neat? How God has a provision for us and provides for us even when we don't, we don't know that he is. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing. Can you receive that? <laughs> Who else? What did God do inside of you? Somebody tell me. Is that a revelation for you guys? I mean, I remember a few years ago, it was a massive revelation for me. Please. I started with, Father, what am I holding back from? Mm. Mm. And he said, Alexis, my child, you are holding back your body from me. Mm. And I had more conversation. He talk, talked to me about other stuff. And then I said, Father, you are my strength, my shield, and my very great reward. 
Thank you. Thank you that where I am weak, you are strong. Thank you that my weakness can be used for your glory. Thank you that your power is made perfect in my weakness, and so I don't need to fear being weak, but to rejoice because that is when you are working. He said, Alexis, there is no need to fear. I have written your story, and it is good. It will include struggles and pain, but also great joy. When you are tempted to be selfish, reach out to me, and my Holy Spirit will give you the strength to do the right thing. I am stronger than your will. And I said, Father, thank you. Help me to remember what you have told me today. And he gave, those, you are my strength, my shield, and my very great word. I'm like, that has to be a verse. And it's a couple verses. Um, do not be afraid. He's talking to Abram. I am your shield and your very great reward. And then in Psalms it says, The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him and he helps me. My heart leaps for joy and I will be, and with my song I praise him. The Lord is my, the strength of his people and a fortress of salvation for his anointed one. Save your people and bless your inheritance. Be their shepherd and carry them forever. I just feel like that those verses are going to be really, really good. Yeah, huge. Line up with scripture. <laughs> it is scripture, yes. Line up with the character of what a good, loving father would say. So good. Yeah, thanks for sharing. Yeah, please. I felt like some of my um, questions that I wrote down, I wasn't ready to hear from God or write it down. Okay. And part of me felt like because I didn't know what scripture said about them. Okay. So. Yep. Is that something the other you and I, or maybe you and an RA, or a brother in, the, in Christ could to talk with you about later. I'm yes. just going to go look and read for more. I felt like Perfect. When I hear him talking to me, it's usually because I read it in scripture. That's neat. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Good. And one resource that I gave you in your orange bags is this bookmark right here. And it talks about who he is. And then it talks about who you are. These are a great place to start when you're looking into this topic. Yeah. Who else? Yeah. Um, I'm not going to read the full thing. That's fine. Kind of conversation. Like, I don't want to read all of that. But um, our first conversation for what God was telling me was to uh, put up a wall against the enemy. OK. Wow. That's pretty deep. Line up with scripture. Line up with the character of what a good loving father would say. Isn't that cool how you asked what you needed to do and instead he was like, this is what I've done. I love that. That's so good. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, long story short, I wrote a decent amount. And okay. Okay. How joyful is the one whose transgression is forgiven, mm. whose sin is covered? How joyful is the man the Lord does not shrug his throat, and whose spirit he does see? When I keep silent, my bones become brittle, and my bones are all day long. For day and night your hand is heavy on me, my strength is drained, and when the sun is heat. Then I acknowledge my sin to you, and did not conceal my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord, and you took away the guilt from my sin. Uh, lines up with scripture, because <laughs> it is. <laughs> Line up with the character of what a good, loving father would say, yeah, what he would lead you to, and how he's going to respond to that when you do those things. That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing. That was awesome. Yeah, good. Yes, please. I didn't share all mine, and I feel like I was supposed to. Okay. So I said, he said, Alexis, my child, you're holding back your body from me, and hmm. I read the end of it, but... Um, after that, I said, Father, I'm sorry for holding my body back from you, for being more concerned about my own comfort and fear of pain than about others who are hurting. Help me, Father, to be sacrificial, even with my own body, and for my first thought to not be about me. Thank 
thank you for my hug. Thank you for giving me a body that I can give back to you. Thank you for taking away my fear of pain and for allowing me to go through that so I can relate and be compassionate to others who have experienced pain. Mm. Wow. It's a beautiful surrender. Thanks for sharing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Great. And you had a neat revelation yesterday. God showed you something that you weren't expecting, right? Do you want to share about that? The picture? Did you have a picture yesterday that you drew? No? It wasn't unexpected. Oh. That was you. Sorry. Yeah, I, was I was like, like maybe I it wasn't her. Confused. It was Maddie. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Didn't mean to scare you, but that was great. Um, yeah. Tell us. Okay. Okay. What happened way. yesterday? Okay. So this was the what do you want to tell me right now about your calling? And I read it and it, it sounded like mission. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then I was drawing and he was like, draw Africa, draw Africa, draw Africa, draw Africa. And then I, and then he was like, draw kids in kind of the Chad area and on Madagascar. So I did. Mm-hmm. I don't know what it means. I do, well, I do know what it means. <laughs> Unexpected. Unexpected. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, you had never really thought about nope, missions I never before. Thought about missions. I honestly didn't want to do missions. So. And now, where's your heart? It's exciting. <laughs> it's exciting. Has God showed you anything that you weren't expecting mm-hmm. when you've done hearing the voice of God? Did He show you some things that you weren't expecting? Yeah. It's kind of crazy that when all of a sudden your hand is drawing Africa and you've never even considered going to Africa, right? Never even thought about it. Yeah. That's a neat place to be. Anybody else? Okay. Yeah, please. Uh, this was something kind of like an answer to a question that he came to me with yesterday. I, uh, he mentioned um, plans and was like, those aren't my plans for you now. And so I was like, what's my plans for me now? No. What's your plans for me now? And he said, Trisha, my plans for you are not yet to pass. Oh, yeah, I didn't hear that either. My plans for you are not yet to pass. Not yet to pass. Hmm. Gets some pretty deep stuff, doesn't he? Yeah. Yeah. And somebody was talking to me about writing music. And, I mean, how cool is it if you can sit down and just say, Father, what do you want to say through a song right now? Talk about some powerful lyrics that can come out. Some powerful melodies that can come out when you use this practice not only in getting a response to a question that's on your heart, but getting a response to something like that of where to take your next song or poem. Yeah, very cool, great. Okay, so turn to a clean page, fresh page. So I told you after I got back from the mission field, after the first two years, I was burned out, like so burned out. I had not turned against God. I wasn't walking away from my faith. I wasn't going into the world. It wasn't like that, guys. I was just burned out because I had just spent two years in the jungle of the Amazon of Brazil planting a church among an unreached people group off of a checklist and believing that chair that we threw. The reason I had done it was in my mind I loved God. I was saved. I was going to heaven, like I said. And I loved him up here, but I didn't have a relationship with him right here in my heart. And I was doing all of the, what I did because I had a calling. I definitely knew I had the calling. And I also had a type A personality that could get it done. But the problem is when you do things in your own strength, guess what? You burn out. You get to a point where you cannot sustain the plans of God With your own strength, it won't work. So I landed at Salome Missionary Homes. Salome Missionary Homes is a place in North Carolina. It's a compound, basically. And it's for missionaries who have been evacuated off the field, had to come off the field for one reason or the other. Could be medical, could be sabbatical, or for someone like myself who had come off the field because my two-year term had ended and I wasn't really sure what I was going to do next with my life. So there I am at Salome Missionary Homes and I'm sharing with a fellow missionary whose name also happened to be Jennifer about my struggle. And I said, look, Jen, like, 
I love God, I do, but I am so burned out right now. I am overwhelmed, I'm depressed, I'm just not even able to open up the scriptures and read. I've got no desire to pray, and that's just not me. And I was like, I don't know what to do. Like, I don't even want to do a quiet time. Like, I used to be so good at doing my quiet time. I'm like, I'll be honest, I haven't even done a quiet time in weeks. And she goes, all right, so come over to my house tomorrow. You're going to do a quiet time with me. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. She goes, 5 o'clock. I said, a.m.? <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I wasn't a morning person. <laughs> I said, I don't even think God's up at 5 a.m. <laughs> and she goes, 5 a.m., my house. Here's what I get for sharing my heart with somebody, right? Gosh, I might as well complain and eat another turtle head. This is terrible. Five o'clock in the morning. So at 4.58, <laughs> I drag myself out of bed, and I walk over to her house, and she shares this scripture with me. Everybody turn with me. Hang on. Where are we at here? Mark. Chapter 1. Whoa, take it easy, Reese's. Mark, chapter 1. Mark, chapter 1, verse 35. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Let me do it again. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. So I said, all right, fine. You've got scriptural reason to be up at this, what I thought was an ungodly hour in the morning. <laughs> I said, let's do this. <laughs> I'm half asleep. And she said, all right, get out your journal. You got your journals, guys? She says, I want you to write down three things that you are grateful for from the last 24 hours. What are three things that you are grateful for from the last 24 hours? So just anything in the last 24 hours that has happened that you are grateful for. In Psalm chapter 22, verse 3, it said that God, it says that God inhabits the praises of his people. How many of you want his presence in your life? Me. So what does that mean that I need to do often? Thank him. Thank him. Be grateful. Gratitude changes your attitude. Write that one down. Gratitude changes your attitude. What was the verse? Psalm 22, verse 3. God inhabits the praises of his people. That's exciting. And so here I am, not having the greatest of attitude at this 5 a.m. hour, but then I start writing things down that I am grateful for from the last 24 hours, and all of a sudden, guess what starts to change? Attitude. My attitude started to change, and I was no longer hating this quite so much. All right, so go ahead, tell me what something you're grateful for from the last 24 hours. Edge. Edge. Oh, cool. Did it go well last night? Good, super. Who else? I'm going to go with uh, wireless communication. Wireless communication. Did you get to talk with somebody last night? Uh -huh. 
Sweet. I bet Mama was happy. What's something you're grateful for? Uh, talking to my dad about scripture. Oh, that's super cool. Yay! Yeah. yeah! Get outside the boat. Go ahead. What are you grateful for? Oh, yeah, cool. Love it. Love it. What do you have? One thing I wrote, Tyler Morgan made it, that's it. Yes, amen to that. Jeez. What else? What over here? Yeah. I'm coming back next semester. Yes, you're coming back next semester. That gets two. Okay. <laughs> what about you? Um, my jam session with Meg. Whoop, whoop. <laughs> I love it. Awesome. Okay, yeah, go ahead. We did have amazing quesadillas on that. They were so good. <laughs> I actually, uh, my fiance, actually one of the things I have on here, made this homemade chicken noodle soup last night, like and made it the day before for last night. And then I saw those quesadillas and I was like, my heart is so torn right now. And I ended up having both. So, <laughs> so I have on here for the quesadillas and the soup that my fiance made, yes. So you start out with praise, because if you're going to do a quiet time, you're going to have the devotions, right? You want his presence, correct? And so what is a surefire way to get his presence? Thankfulness, gratitude. So I do now what's called my five thankful thrives. And every day, the first thing I do when my eyes open is I list off five things that I'm grateful for from the last 24 hours. And here's the rule. You're never allowed to repeat anything. Oh, <laughs> yep. You're never allowed to repeat anything. You gotta have a good memory for that. Challenge me to do this thankful journal. Uh huh. I have 800 items and I haven't repeated one. So she's like, you cannot repeat. That's right. So she was like, I do this every day. It's just like 10 items a day, and I'm like, love it. Okay. Yep. I've been doing it for like five months now. That's awesome. Yep, keep doing it. So good. And actually, statistically, people who have a uh, heart of gratitude or have a gratitude practice, they're actually known for living longer, which is pretty cool. And I want to live a really long time. So there you go. All right. So the first thing that I do when I have a, a quiet time, when I have my quiet time, and what this lady taught me was first, what are you grateful for? So there we go. I wrote that out. Then the second thing that she said to do was to go ahead and read a passage of scripture. So go ahead right now and let's turn to Psalm chapter 23. Very familiar passage. Psalm chapter 23. And you might have a Bible reading program you're going through. Somebody mentioned a couple of days ago about how awesome the book of Proverbs is because there's 31 Proverbs. So you could do one every day. And it's not tough to figure out which one to read each day because just look at the date on the calendar and that's the one you should read. Um, other, other books are great, but let me tell you, I am all about scripture. Devotional books are good. I highly recommend Jesus Calling by Sarah Young. That one's a fantastic book. It will really teach you about the heart of the Father um, and how to hear the voice of God because that's what Sarah did. Sarah did the, I mean, the how to hear the voice of God practice that we've been doing. She just did that while she was on the mission field and turned it into a book. Very cool. So anyway, we've done our gratitude practice. Now we're going to read scripture, right? Because we know for a fact that this is the voice of God. So Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let's read it one more time. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup overflows. 
Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I always read it twice. Have you guys picked up on that? Every scripture I read, I always read twice. The reason for that is, well, first of all, I want a double portion blessing. I want a double portion, so I go ahead and read it twice. The other reason is sometimes with scripture, it's a little hard, not with this, but with other scriptures, it's hard to get imagery with it. And the mind thinks in pictures. And I want to make sure that I'm not just reading words, but I'm really internalizing it and understanding it. And for me, that often takes two reads. So I highly recommend read it twice. Okay, so we've done our gratitude practice. We've now read our scripture. Now write something down from that scripture that you really liked. Just write it down. What's something that you liked about that? What's something you remember, something you want to hold on to? It could be what I would call like a highlighter moment. Something that you would highlight about that. A key phrase, maybe a verse. You want to write down the verse. Okay, what did you write down? Go ahead. You're really excited about yours. I'm all about it. Go for it. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. I just really, I didn't realize that I thought it was the other way around. What do you mean you thought it was the other way around? I don't know. I've just been like going for a long time feeling like I've been like having so many bad things, but like through all the trials, I could do, but then I realized like it's like all the good things that I'm seeing. That's awesome. Yeah. It's cool. Yeah. Super cool. Okay, who else? Yeah. I wrote down the first part of verse 4. Even uh-huh. though I walk through the valley of the, sh- of the shadow of death, I will mm-hmm. no evil for you are with me. Yeah, it's powerful. I love it. Good. What else? Yeah. Mm, that's so nice. Love those green pastures. Yes. Mm. Yeah. It means you're not going to be in want for anything. You're not going to need anything. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Why is that important to you? Um, it just reminded me of like, God's protection over me. Yeah, yeah, good. Um, and I write down these questions like, you know, how do I let go of my pain and will you cure me of my addictions and stuff? It gets tiring. Mm. So I, I wrote down, he refreshes my soul. Oh, he refreshes my soul. So good. Okay, so now we're going to do the Hear the Voice of God practice. Father, what do you want to tell me right now about, and it's going to be about whatever you just wrote here. Father, what do you want to tell me about how you refresh my soul? Father, what do you want to tell me about leading me beside still waters? Father, what do you want to tell me about whatever it is that you notated? Once you've written the question, do the four steps. Calm your mind. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Listen. Write your name. And then just keep writing.
once you have that written, go ahead and draw your little picture. The mind thinks in pictures, and that picture is what's going to carry you through the day. That's what's going to stick with you, and Holy Spirit's going to bring that picture to your mind throughout the day so you can remember what he said to you. Okay, take 30 more seconds. Okay, now show that picture to the person next to you and tell them, don't read for them, but tell them what God said to you and why you drew that picture. What's he telling you? Yeah, sure. Okay, what did the Lord tell you? Do you want to share? Yeah. Please do. So I said, Father, what do you want to tell me about fearing no evil? Uh, Lord, my daughter, with me you have light, and when there is light, the darkness is temple. You already are aware that I am within you, so why do you continue to harp on fear? I am your eternal comforter. I am your shield. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. Lean on me when you are fearful of anything the enemy puts on your mind. Run to me, not to others, for they cannot rest. Wow. Line up with scripture. Line up with the character of what a good loving father would say. Yeah, that'll, that'll carry you through the day. That's awesome. Good. Anybody else want to share theirs? Yeah, please. Um, he just repeated the verse to me and put the perspective. He said, okay. even though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you will fear no evil for I am with you. Very cool. I love when he does that or when he inserts my name into a verse. And I'm like, whoa, that totally just changed the verse. Like, that's so good. I love it. Very cool. Yes, so over here. I'll come right back over here. Um, Father, what do you want to tell me about your rod and your staff to comfort me? 
Alexis, I am your comfort, even if all com other comforts fail or you deny yourself of me. I will be your comfort. I am your protection. With my rod and staff, I will protect you from the enemy. He is not allowed to touch you. And I drew myself in his hand and in between his rod and staff with arrows coming and being reflected away. Oh, that's cool. I like it. Yes, good. Somebody over here had their hand raised? Do you want to share? Yeah, please. So uh, mine's the same, same as Zach's, it's, uh, even though I walk through this valley of shadow of death. Uh -huh. I'm clearing it evil because you're with me. Uh -huh. And he uh, just said, call me my name, it's above all the other names. You shall desire nothing before me. Oh, that's good. Yeah, cool. Okay. And then she said, after you do that, I want you to write three more things that you're grateful for from the last 24 hours. <laughs> three more things that you're grateful for from the last 24 hours. Why? Because God inhabits the presence of his people. I'm getting ready to go out into the world, and don't I want to go out in there with his presence? Absolutely. So write down three more things that you're grateful for from the last 24 hours. Not repeating. Not repeating. You can never repeat, ever. I mean, in your mind, you can. What are some of your things? You can read all three, sure. I said Emily for cooking us food and Nate for running our house and Rick for putting it all together. Love it. Oh, that's so good. Who else? Three things. Yes. I said uh, God's sovereignty, um, the peace that I have is rooted in him, and then the kids that are Oh, super cool. So great. Who else? Yes. Yes, all super. There's guys, my date with Trisha, and don't be a caboose. Sorry. Don't give me. Yes. I love that. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, yeah. Did you have your hand up? Please. Oh, yeah. Good. Super. And then she said, You've had just had a meaningful quiet time. And I was like, No, no, wait, wait. I said, Don't I have to read more chapters? And she said, do you want to read more chapters? I said, but wait, I didn't go through my list and confess all my sins and tell God everything I was sorry and for and everything I did wrong. And, and I didn't pray for all the people yet and all the missionaries and all those other countries yet. Just, do you want to do those things? Or is it obligation that you were doing those things? She said, because if it was actually on the heart of God for you to do those things, it would have come out in the dialogue. She said, you were doing religion, not relationship. How many of you think you'd have a really great, great quiet time every morning if you did this? It's changed my life. Do you wake your brain up every morning, too? Wakes my brain up every morning. Yes. Yeah. Oh, when did you learn how to do the listening to God? About six years ago. Seven years ago. Seven years ago now. Yeah. How to hear God's voice. Mark Berkler. Yep, and then Mark and I became good friends, and then Mark and I went on a touring with his book on the four keys to hearing the voice of God. And he did the United States, and I toured in Brazil, and we taught it all over. We taught people all over Brazil and people all over the U.S. how to do it. Were you skeptical when you first learned it or first heard about it? Um, I was desperate, and I wanted a relationship. I was hungry for that relationship, even though I didn't know I was hungry and thirsty for it. So as soon as he taught it to me, and I, I actually put my pen to the paper, wrote my name, and then just kept writing and realized it lined up with scripture, it lined up with the character of what a good loving father would say, I was in. I was sold. I loved it. And it's changed my life. And some people are like, oh, I don't believe in it. Well, okay, that's fine. Don't do it then. 
I mean, I, I believe it for me and I love it for me. I've taught it all over the world and it's changed people's lives. So that's why I do it. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah? Sure. After a while, um, you kind of figure out that it's okay to cross things out, like you were saying. And so, like, it, like every word that you write down doesn't have as much weight as, like, the scripture has. Right. But it's still, like, God speaks so much through it. It's, like, crazy. I'll be looking back from, like, years before, and I'm like, whoa, that, I didn't realize that was God until years later. So, like, I can, like, test this as, like, a good, like, this is a good message. And remember, in the quiet time that I just taught you to do, what did we do before we did how to hear the voice of God? Thankfulness. We did thankfulness, and then we did what? We read scripture. Never replace how to hear the voice of God practice with the reading practice of scripture. This should always come first. Now, during the day as I'm out and about, I'm at surfing or I'm, you know, at Walmart or whatever, am I going to sit down and read scripture first before I do that because I might hear the voice of God when I'm out there? No. I mean, it's just like reading scripture is in my daily practice anyway. And I just make sure I'm continually feeding on his word, which then allows me to know even better when I do hear his voice because I know it lines up with scripture. So, yeah, never replace how to hear the voice of God with your reading practice. Keep doing that, but combine them together and it's a powerful thing. Yeah. So <coughs> this meaningful quiet time practice is not the only way to do it. Don't think because jungle is trying to do it, this is like how I have to do it. No, you do your own thing. I'm just sharing with you what she shared with me because it was what I needed in that moment to go to the next level of intimacy with the Father. So Father, thank you. I just want to say thank you. You're just so awesome. Thank you for speaking to us. Thank you for the beauty around us. Thank you that we've gotten to grow together. But most of all, thank you that we get to grow deeper in relationship with you. You're such a good, good father. We love you so much. And all God's people said, amen. All right, take a 10-minute break, guys, and then Tony will be in here.